Welcome back you guys and I just dropped a video on the major free agents and where I think their best fits are. Those players will be getting the majority of the minutes in the starting lineup at their position. They'll be the lead guy or one of the lead guys for their team's offense. But what about guys that can help fill out a team's 10 man rotation during the regular season? Guys that can either play in a backup role or as a secondary player in the starting lineup next to ball dominant players. We got 10 of them so let me know which team should try to grab these players. Austin Rivers is the first player on this list, and I'm probably one of the few Austin Rivers defenders left on the internet. He had a pretty bad 29 games with the Washington Wizards, but when he got picked up by the Houston Rockets, he returned back to what I normally know him as, a good secondary scorer that can defend well enough in your lineup. What saved the season was this playoff run. He shot 45% on threes in the playoffs and had multiple games against the Warriors where he hit big shots to stop momentum when the game could have gotten out of hand. If you can compete and play big minutes against the Warriors with Kevin Durant, you're valuable in anybody's lineup. The Rockets should try to bring him back, but there are other teams probably trying to get him also. The Warriors should try to get him since they're going to have a tough time creating offense with Clay and KD out. If you are a playoff team with bench perimeter scoring problems, try to get Austin to sign a contract. The second player I got on here is Ricky Rubio, and it's looking like he's going to sign with the Indiana Pacers, so I guess I have slightly less to talk about with him. What I like about Rubio is that he's good at making timely passes and he can defend other perimeter players. Having a player that's not only a good passer but a willing passer is much needed when you have a bunch of guys in the league that love to shoot. Rubio is a slight upgrade over Collison because he's a better defender and better passer. He's not as good of a shooter as Collison, so teams that play the Pacers are going to sag off of him just like they did in Utah. I was selfishly hoping that a young developing team like the Chicago Bulls, Phoenix Suns, or New York Knicks would grab Rubio. Yeah, I know, he hurts the spacing of your team, but you need guys that can pass. I know I keep mentioning it, but passing is such an underrated and tough skill to master, so if you can get someone to help your younger players get easy shots, you should try to bring them in. The Pacers fit is cool, I guess. They'll stay competitive and make that playoff push once Oladipo gets back. The third player on here I got is Kavon Looney of the Golden State Warriors. He really increased his value this year as a player. He's a 6'9 center that can't do much on offense, but he can defend without fouling and guard smaller players on the perimeter. You need centers like that in today's NBA in the playoffs. Houston and Boston are apparently interested in Looney, but the Warriors can't mess up here and not make a good offer to him. They gotta bring Looney back because he fits and knows their system. The next free agent we're going to talk about is Thaddeus Young. He's a 31-year-old 6'8 power forward that has played the last three seasons with the Indiana Pacers. Before I get into Thad as a player, I want to bring this up. If I was one of the people running the NBA, I would add a third team for the All-Defensive Team Award. You got three teams for All-NBA, but there's only two All-Defensive, and I would do that because there's always great defenders that never get recognized. Sometimes it's because they don't have as good of a reputation for being a defender as other guys. It's also a bit of they're not recognized enough because they play in a small market, or even worse, they play in a small market, plus they don't get any nationally televised games. Thaddeus Young is one of those players that do not get recognized enough for his individual and team defense IQ. If there was a third all-defensive team, Thaddeus Young would be on it for me. Miles Turner got a lot of love for Defensive Player of the Year, and it was rightfully deserved, but Thaddeus is just as important to the Pacers' defense as Miles is. He switched between defending power forwards and guards on the same possession countless times throughout the season. He covers up so many holes because of his quick feet and 7 foot 1 wingspan. He's one of those rare guys that is as good of a team defender as he is defending one on one. Apparently the Utah Jazz have interest in Thaddeus and that'd make Utah's defense probably the best during the regular season. Hopefully it's not one of these bad teams that have cap space that gets him because Thaddeus fits best on a competitive playoff team. Next up is another Indiana Pacer, and that is Bojan Bogdanovich. Out of all the players on this list, Bojan is probably going to end up being the highest paid. I look at him as an underrated player because of his second half of the year. When Victor Oladipo was ruled out for the season, Bojan went from a secondary playmaker to the number one option on offense and increased his scoring with good efficiency. I believe in the last two and a half months of the season, Bojan was putting up over 20 points per game on 60% true shooting, which is well above the league average. The league average for true shooting is around 55%. He's a 40% three-point shooter, willing to play off the ball and can make passes, so he fits most teams' offensive styles. I'd say he is an above-average defender. He's not overwhelmingly physical, but he can play within a team defense and can stay in front of his man. 
So the Utah Jazz are apparently interested in Bojan, and this would be a ridiculous fit spacing-wise when you add him next to Joe Ingles, Donovan Mitchell, and Mike Conley. The main problem the Jazz had the last few years is they didn't have much shot creation outside of one or two guys at all times. It was tough for them to score. When you have four guys that can put the ball on the floor, that's a scary thing for defenses because you can't hide your bad defenders anywhere. The Jazz are always going to be able to have a guy that can get a shot off. If Utah can bring in Bojan, that puts them right there as a possible conference finals favorite. Seth Curry is next up on my list, and what was cool about Seth's 2019 season is that he missed the entire 2018 season due to an injury and didn't miss a beat this year. For Portland this year, he shot 45% on threes, and on threes in the playoffs, he shot 40%. That's a big thing right there. Can you be as efficient in the regular season as you are in the postseason? Seth definitely was. He had a few big games against Denver, OKC, and Golden State. There are so many three-point shooters in the NBA that go crazy in the regular season, but they fold in the playoffs because teams focus on them more and they can't counter the extra defensive pressure. When you see somebody able to transfer regular season success to the playoffs, it means they are a legit player. But it's looking like Portland wants to move on and try to develop Anthony Simons next season as a full-time backup. Seth fits any team, really. He has transferable skills as a backup point guard and somebody that can spot up in a starting lineup that has a bunch of ball-dominant players. The Lakers have interest in him, but so does every other hopeful playoff team, because who doesn't want a guy that can shoot 45% on threes? Jermichael Green is an underrated free agent this summer and had a very good year with the LA Clippers. At the trade deadline, he was moved from the Memphis Grizzlies to the LA Clippers as a backup power forward. In 24 games with the Clippers, Jermichael put up 9 points, 7 rebounds, over 20 minutes per game. He is 6'9", 230 pounds, and is one of those rare power forwards that can defend on the perimeter and shoot 3-point shots. He shot nearly 40% on threes on 3 attempts per game last season. Just like Thaddeus Young, he fits on a playoff team that needs somebody to get rebounds, space out the floor for everybody else, and clean up defensively. Everyone always talks about how the Clippers were able to steal games from the Warriors, but nobody talks about how Jermichael was one of the reasons why they made it tough on them. They moved Jermichael into the starting lineup against the Golden State Warriors, which allowed them to play a more versatile defensive lineup. He is definitely an underrated player, and if the Lakers don't get Kawhi, they need to go after Jermichael Green. Rashawn Holmes is the third to last player in this video, and he is somebody that will be a nice backup center for whoever he signs with. If you're looking for a somewhat cheap backup that can finish at the rim, run the floor, and defend, then Holmes is your guy. He was the backup for the Phoenix Suns and Philadelphia 76ers the last two years. In 17 minutes per game with Phoenix this past year, he averaged 8 points, 5 rebounds, and had a block per game. He really fits anywhere. You can put him on a non-playoff team or a playoff team. With so many bigs on the market, I could see somebody snatching Holmes on a good price. Jeremy Lamb is the second to last player on here, and with Kemba Walker going to the Boston Celtics, I have a hard time seeing the Charlotte Hornets being able to match the competitive offers that Jeremy Lamb is going to get. The Hornets are going to be bad, man. They might be rolling out a lineup with Marvin Williams as the number one option. If I was running the Hornets, I would just let Jeremy Lamb walk and be really bad so we can hopefully get some lottery luck in 2020. As Kemba Walker's number two, he averaged 15 points, 5 rebounds, and shot 44% overall and 34% on threes. On a playoff team, he definitely fits in as a secondary scorer in your starting lineup or as a sixth man. I would put him in early consideration for being sixth man of the year if he goes to a team with a more established shooting guard. Lamb is 27 years old, so he's in the middle of his prime and I wouldn't expect too much development from here on. This is probably who he is as a player, which isn't a bad thing. Shot creation is much needed on bench lineups and as a last resort in your starting lineup. Maybe with better players next to him or in a situation where he's not looked at as the second option, Lamb becomes a more efficient player in a team offense. The last player on here is Tomas Sadoransky of the Washington Wizards. I believe he is the only restricted free agent in this video. Tomas is a 6'7 point guard slash shooting guard that moves the ball really well. I'm probably going to harp on this point a lot more. Having guys in your lineup that are willing passers is just as important as being able to shoot threes. What happens when the guy that only shoots threes gets shut down? He can't do anything else. Sadoransky can't shoot, but he can make plays with his dribble and passing. Now, he is not a high volume three point shooter or somebody that gets to the rim consistently. He's somebody that took over the point guard role when John Wall went out and got the ball moving. 
If you don't really pay attention to the Wizards, I don't blame you, but in the games he matched up against guys like Trey Young, Kyle Lowry, Kyrie, and Kemba, he defended them well. Again, he is tall with quick feet, so he is tough to deal with sometimes. The Wizards will probably bring him back since they have his rights as a restricted player, but if another team grabs him, they should be a team that already has ball dominant players, so Tomas can excel in his secondary role. And that is it for me, if you made it to the end of this video, shout out to you. Some of these players will already be signed to a team by the time you watch this, but hey, I wanted to drop it before the madness started, so I'll see you guys soon with more free agency videos.